Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath and welcome to our Cyber School lesson uh, study today. Our lesson today is lesson five of our Adventist Bible study guide. This, this, is, this is the guide. And for this quarter, the topic is uh, making friends for God and the joy of sharing his mission. It is about witnessing. Uh, you can get this study guide on our website. It's absg.adventist.org. ABSG stands for Adventist Bible School Guide. Before we go into our lesson about the Holy Spirit, and witnessing, I'd like to invite all of us to uh, bow our heads for prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed Sabbath day that we can gather together to worship you and acknowledge you as God and Savior. May your name be uplifted and praised. May you accept our worship and bless all who worship you today. May your word of life lead us to salvation, and may we all be receptive to your word. May your spirit give us understanding, wisdom, hope, and faith to face the challenges of our daily lives. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So today our lesson is about the Holy Spirit. And in the book of John, chapter 14, Jesus told his disciples before he ascended to heaven, after his resurrection, that he will send the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Comforter means advocate. And he will abide with you forever and teach you all things. So here Jesus promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit will help them and teach them in their life and their witnessing of the gospel. The word help comes from the Greek word parakletos, which means to walk beside you. So we are promised the Holy Spirit. So the first thing I think, the first question we all ask, I ask myself is, what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? Anybody? Like a companion in our life? I don't know. Is it companion, maybe? A companion? Yes. I have a few texts here that tell us who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we turn to Exodus 31, 2 to 3. Exodus 31, 2 to 3. Uh, I will paraphrase this text. This text actually tells us about a man named Bezalel. He is an expert craftsman chosen by God for the intricate, in, intricate uh, furnishing of the tabernacle. The text says that he was filled with the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit actually is the Spirit of God. So let's go to another text, John 14, verse 17. Tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Word of God in spirit form. So Holy Spirit speaks the truth. So the Holy Spirit is the Word of God in spirit form. Now come to the last verse. I have a lot, but I just quote three. First uh, Peter 1.11 tells us that when the disciples testify, the Spirit of Christ was with, with them. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, we learned that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And uh, He is God's representative on our earth. We are told that Jesus cannot be in every place because he is cumbered with humanity. He is limited by his physical limitation. So he sent his spirit, the Holy Spirit. We, we, we got that. The Holy Spirit is spirit of God, spirit of Christ. Let's, let's go to a second observation of the Holy Spirit. 
my second observation is that the Holy Spirit is a person. Why is he a person? Well, the Bible uh, uses a personal pronoun, he, he. So I'm going to give you a, a few texts that, that relate to that. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to X 5, 3 to 4. X 5, 3 to 4. This text tells us that the Holy Spirit can be tempted. The Holy Spirit, he can be lied to as Jesus was tempted. So this text actually referred to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple during Peter's time who was supposed to give all the money promised to the temple after selling their possession, but they wanted to keep some of it and they lied to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he can be lied to. He's the person. We go to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, tells us that the Holy Spirit, he has a mind of his own. He can intercede for you. And then we go to Romans 15, 13, tells us that he is capable of loving us. And finally, Ephesians 4, 30, tells us that he can be grieved or saddened. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not a nebulous force, like some people think it is. And he is not an apparition. Actually, he uh, is a person. He can be lied to. He can be tempted. I'd like to draw uh, your attention to the last text about uh, Ephesians 4.30. Maybe if you, all, if you all can, we'll turn to this text because it tells us a little bit more about the Holy Spirit as a person. Uh, can someone read Ephesians 4 verse 30? It tells us a little bit more about the Holy Spirit as a person. Ephesians 4 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Thank you. So what this verse is telling us is that do not bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit by the way we live our lives, concentrating only on listening to ourselves and not the Holy Spirit. Constant rejection, the voice and the counsel of the Holy Spirit. You see, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we are told that the, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can keep us from living a life of sin, and can seal us for the day of God's deliverance. So if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we cannot be sealed by Him, and we cannot overcome our sin. So it's a very strong uh, a warning here not to uh, grieve or sadden the Holy Spirit. So we, we just, we, 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 we understand that the Holy Spirit is, is, is God and Jesus' spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. And this person, actually, we learn from the Bible, is the third person of the Godhead, right? The Holy Spirit, third person. How do we know that? Because we, we, we learn that when the world was created, it was in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. This is in Genesis chapter 1. And then we... we, we uh, we read in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 says, Jesus says that when you baptize someone, we do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in the second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, you know, when Paul visits a church and pronounces uh, blessings from God, what what what, does, what did Paul usually say? Let me, let me uh, quote Paul says to you. When he pronounced blessing, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all. So we know that uh, the Godhead is consist, uh, consists of, uh, our Godhead consists of three persons. So now we're going to come to a little bit uh, the mystery of the Holy Spirit. Because some people would say to you, 
uh, what happened in, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Moses said, the Lord our God is one God. So, so how do you explain this contradiction? The Lord our God is one God. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus also said, the Lord our God is one Lord. How do you explain that? Anyone? Well, uh, the, the best way to explain this is I, I got a quotation from Mrs. White. Mrs. White is one of our pioneer leaders of our church. And she said, she gave us an advice. And this is, this is a quote from the Acts of Apostle, page 51. This is the words of Mrs. White. Mrs. White says that the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. And man cannot explain it because God has not revealed it. Such mystery is too deep for human understanding. So silence is golden. So we have to realize our human limitation in understanding all spiritual things. And uh, except by faith, what is revealed to us? You know, an infinite God is beyond our finite understanding. But you know, we are promised in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 12, that one day we will know all things as God knows us when we get to heaven. Today, we see the world darkly, means not clearly, but one day, one day we will know it. So, uh, any question before I go a little bit further? Any comments? No? So after learning about the Holy Spirit, the next question is, how do we get the Holy Spirit? How do we get the Holy Spirit? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 39. I think we all want to have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is our only connection with God. Without the Holy Spirit, we do not have God. So it's very important. So we all want to have the Holy Spirit. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Can someone please read this verse for me? Acts chapter 2, verse 39. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar. As many the Lord our God will call. Is it Acts chapter 2, verse 39? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, 38. I'm sorry, 38. Okay. Then I'm Peter, sorry. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad we found the right text. Jesus also said that you have to believe in me to have eternal life. So here we look at the key words of these two texts is that first we have to have faith and believe that Christ is our Savior, and then we repent and be baptized. So, so baptism actually is very important uh, to receive the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is a, a very sacred and important ordinance. Actually, an ordinance is, is, a, is a law and an example that Jesus did and he wants us to follow. Another ordinance I could think of is the, uh, is the ordinance of the uh, communion service and foot washing. So baptism actually is an outward expression of our inner faith, of renouncing and separation from the world and being a family of God. And in Romans chapter 6, it tells us what happened to you when you are baptized. Let me share with you what it says. It says that when we are baptized, we are buried with Christ into his death. Our old self is crucified with him. And when we all come out of the water, uh, 
This symbolizes resurrection. We become a new person filled with the Holy Spirit. So here, to get the Holy Spirit, you can see uh, that you have to, to uh, be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you can see that salvation in Christ is not just saying, I believe, I'm saved. And I'm born again, as many people do. Salvation is a continue, continuous process of faith, repentance, baptism, and obedience. Because Jesus said, if you keep my commandment, you abide in my love, obedience to the law of God. So come to the, the question, how do we get the Holy Spirit? We get the Holy Spirit through the ordinance of baptism. We also get the Holy Spirit through a daily prayer and supplication, inviting the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Anybody has any uh, comments, any question about how we get the Holy Spirit? So what happened when we have the Holy Spirit? What happened? What happened to you? Well, in the book of Acts 4, chapter 3, it says that you will speak with boldness. That means you, meaning you, you would speak without fear or doubt in your witnessing. And then in Acts 17, verse 6 tells us that, that Paul and Silas, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they have turned the world upside down. So you can see that uh, the Holy Spirit is so powerful, He can empower us, you know, to speak with boldness and turn the world upside down. And when we have the Holy Spirit, it says the Holy Spirit will give us its fruit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. And from love, we develop all the characteristics of love, which is joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And these lead us to do our works of love. So the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual fruit uh, of love, and the Holy Spirit will also give us spiritual gift. What is spiritual gift? Spiritual gift are spiritual talent for the work of the ministry and for witnessing and edifying the body of Christ. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that uh, some of the spiritual gifts that the Spirit will give us, some of the talents that, is, yeah, you can be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, administrator, hospitality, and finally speaking in tongues. So spiritual, uh, so spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit empowers us to do God's mission. And uh, finally, before I go into examples of the work of the Holy Spirit, I want to give you one more very important property of the Holy Spirit. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you all to turn to John chapter 16, verse 8. John chapter 16, verse 8. I would like to invite someone to read that verse for me. This is another important property of the Holy Spirit that, that we should remember. John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Thank you, Ivan. What this, what Jesus is saying that, that, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't work only in us. The, worry, the Holy Spirit works on the people who are listening to us. So what does the Holy Spirit do? It will reprove the world of sin, meaning it will convince the world that it is sinful and that it needs to save it. And then he says the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of righteousness meaning that the Holy Spirit will convince the world of its need for the righteousness of Christ. The Holy Spirit is working on the listener. 
And the last one is that reprove the world of judgment, meaning to warn the world that there is impending judgment before God. So here we learn that the Holy Spirit job is to convict and convert the world. See, all you and I have to do is just witness and preach the gospel of Christ. It's not very difficult. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We do not have to carry the burden of saving the world. Jesus and the Holy Spirit already did. Now, before I go to the book of Acts uh, to learn about witnessing of the disciples and the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to review just the vital importance of all of us to have the Holy Spirit. Because today's lesson, to, I, I, we just have to learn about the Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to spend uh, a minute revising, re, uh, revising the vital importance of us having the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption, meaning we must not be separated from the Holy Spirit, whereby you are not sealed, not having the seal of approval or acceptance of God. So do not separate yourself from the Holy Spirit. John 5.5, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without abiding in me, you cannot bear fruit, meaning without my spirit, you can do nothing. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot overcome sin and live a righteous life. Last one is in Acts chapter 5, verses uh, 20, uh, verses 2 or 21, I'm not sure. Tells us that Peter and the uh, other apostles, tells us uh, Peter and the other apostles, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, they have not only a witness, but they in, their witness includes signs and wonders and miracles. So the Holy Spirit can empower you to do uh, miracles. Now come to the last verse. First uh, Peter three eighteen tells tells us that tells us about Christ suffering for our sins, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So this text tells us that. Jesus was resurrected by the Holy Spirit. And it was true, and it is true, the power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ worked for our salvation and free us from the prison of sin. So the Holy Spirit, remember, without the Holy Spirit, we have no connection with Christ, no relationship with Christ. So it is vitally important that we live a life of repentance and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we now, we are going to the book of Acts. And uh, Bible scholars tell us that the book of Acts is, is the working of the Holy Spirit through the disciples. So we want to learn the correct way of witnessing. We want to see the examples of, of the disciples uh, in the book of Acts. If someone says that if we don't see uh, it being done by the disciples in the book of Acts, in witnessing, we should not do it. Let me give you some examples of churches that have deviated from proper witnessing. Let's look at the charismatic movement of some Christian church. You know, the word charismatic means a charm, personal charm, personal gift. In this case, the speaking in tongues, some people call it uh, speaking in unknown language or some people even call it gibberish. These witnesses use speaking in tongues to measure their self-worth and to show that they have the Holy Spirit. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, we do not see the apostles speaking in, in tongues all the time, or maybe once at, the, at Pentecost, they were speaking other languages. The second, the uh, problem we have here is in America, we all speak the same language. There's no necessity to speak in tongues. And the third, the third is very important. The charismatics claim that they have new 
revelation, new light. There's, that is an incorrect statement. None of us have light or new light. Jesus and the word of God is the only light. We are to reflect the light of Christ. Be careful when someone claims that they have new light from God. So you can see that charismatic witnessing is using man's ability to attract and influence others. It is not content to just uh, witness Christ alone, which is what our witnessing should be. Any comments on this charismatic movement? I'd like to give you another example. This is the miracle healings you see on evangelism on TV. You'll notice their witnessing consists of uh, com combining, commanding the Holy Spirit to come down from heaven. There's no witnessing of Christ or his grace. We do not see the apostles do that in the book of Acts. They do healing, but not in the place of witnessing. They do not command or lead the Holy Spirit. They submit to the Holy Spirit. So the act of healing is now their gospel, not Christ. This healing, so-called miracles have been exposed to be sometimes a sham and not really real. These are not really true witnessing for Christ. So let's go to the book of Acts and look at some of the correct approach to witnessing by the apostles and the Holy Spirit. Anybody has any uh, comments uh, before we go in the book of Acts and look at some of the correct approach to witnessing? Let's look at the story of Peter's great success in witnessing on the day of Pentecost. You know, the word Pentecost means 50th. Pentecost is celebrated seven weeks after Passover on the 50th day. What, what does Pentecost celebrate? It celebrates the grain and the wheat harvest. Once a year, Passover and Pentecost are celebrated by all the Jews coming to Jerusalem from many surrounding countries. We know that Peter and the apostles spent four days with Jesus after his resurrection in the upper room. And they would, and, and in their earnest prayer, they were now filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, that the Peter gave a very powerful sermon and converted 3,000, and a few days later, converted another 5,000. So what can we learn from this story of our Peter? Well, the first thing we learn is that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he preached with boldness and with power. The second thing we learn is that the Holy Spirit came down. In this case, it says like wind and give them the spiritual gift of speaking in different languages. And the third thing we want to notice is that the outpouring of spirit is called the early rain. This is very important for us to, as Christians because we are living in the last days uh, we, we are told that, that there, there will be a time of early rain and latter rain, which is to come, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter time, maybe in our lifetime. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the early rain and the latter rain. You know, during the time of Israel, there were two seasons of heavy rain. The early rain in Spain, uh, in spring, is necessary for the seed to germ germinate and for the first harvest. Then there will be a latter rain in the fall to prepare the grain and the wheat for the last harvest of the year. So the story of the Pentecost is a symbol of the early rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit uh, do? They germinate and begin the growth on the earth of the apostolic church. So the, the Holy Spirit started the early rain. And we are told in Joel, Joel 2, 28 and 29, 
to prepare for the later rain. It says there will time there will come a time when your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and, and, and the young men will see vision. So we will be uh, we will be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit to do the last to to do the, the effort of the, the latter rain to spread the last uh, great effort. And this latter rain is to prepare the world for the great harvest of the second coming. So how do we have the latter rain? How do we prepare for the latter rain? As you know, we really know we have the Holy Spirit, right? We have to fill our hearts. Uh, our, our sins have to be blotted out and we have to fill our hearts with uh, the fruit of the Spirit and we have a, to have, have a repentance. So, so we all have to uh, look forward to uh, preparing ourselves for the latter way. Any comment about the, the early and the latter rain? Let's look at another example of the work of the Holy Spirit. This time the story is found in Acts chapter 8, verse 29 to 39. Here we learn that the Holy Spirit instructed Philip, one of the disciples, to go to Gaza from uh, Jerusalem. You know, Gaza is located between Egypt and Israel. It's still in existence today. Along the way, Peter met an Ethiopian eunuch. He is the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. Philip took the opportunity to explain to the eunuch the book of Isaiah regarding the crucifixion of Christ in the gospel of salvation. And then the, the eunuch uh, requests uh, baptism. So what can we learn about this story, about witnessing? Well, this story is interesting because it is the first mention in the Bible of witnessing to a black man from the continent of Africa. The Holy Spirit is carrying out the great commission of Christ to witness to all nations. And you know, Bible scholars tell us that Ethiopia, where the eunuch is from, is the only country in Africa that have consistently kept the Sabbath for centuries. It's a very religious country. Could this be from the result of Philip's conversion? You think about it, right? Now I just have just a few more, a couple more examples. Uh, we, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is, is talking about uh, Peter was in Joppa. Joppa is a coastal city in Israel. It is now noon time, and he was very hungry. Noon time, they eat at noon. He fell asleep, and God gave him a vision: a big sheep filled with unclean bees and fowls and creepy things. And God told Peter to eat these animals three times. But Peter replied and says he cannot because they were unclean. And the Holy Spirit told Peter, "What God called clean, do not call unclean." So in the meantime, an angel instructed a centurion, a Roman officer, a God-fearing man, to send for Peter. So when the centurion man came to invite Peter, Peter was hesitant to go. But the Holy Spirit again, this time, remind Peter of what uh, the Holy Spirit had told him before, that do not call a person unclean when, when God has called him clean. So Peter went to the uh, centurion's home, and it says that the whole family, the Holy Spirit fell on all the Gentiles and all the Jews, and they were all baptized. So what lesson can we learn here? Well, it teaches us that the Holy Spirit is no respecter of person. Anyone who fear and acknowledge God is accepted by God, even a Roman officer, a Gentile, a symbol of Christ, tormentor and crucifier, an enemy of Christ. 
Any comment on this story? Let's go to our fourth example. I think I just have one more left. Our final story is from Acts chapter 15. Story of Paul's witnessing. We are told that after Paul's second mission, mission, uh, missionary journey in Asia, he decided to go to a coastal city called Bithynia. But the, the Holy Spirit intervened and redirected Paul to go to Philippi in Macedonia. Because the Holy Spirit knew, knew that this city, Bithynia, was not ready for Paul. So you can see here that the Holy Spirit directs his journey and his path. The Holy Spirit will direct your path if you witness. So where is Macedonia? Well, Macedonia today is northern Greece. It includes the Balkans, you know, the Albania, the Croatia, Serbia. You can see that it is in Europe. So the Holy Spirit is leading Paul to witness in Europe and later in Rome. So, so the Holy Spirit is leading witnesses all over the world. So this trip uh, tells us that the Holy Spirit led Paul to the house of Lydia. Lydia is a Jewish businesswoman. She makes purple dyes for dyeing royal and priestly robes. She was a worshiper. She opened her home and Paul went and preached and many, many were converted. So what can we learn from this story? Well, we can learn from this story is that here was a Jewish woman. A Jewish woman is not a very important person in Jewish society. Women are not highly respected, usually not educated and do not have rights. And, and we are told that in this city, uh, we found out later that it's a Roman city very few Jewish converts. So, so Paul actually was directed by the Holy Spirit to go to this Jewish lady's house and that this lady's house probably became the nucleus of a new, a new small church. So here we again, we are taught by the Holy Spirit that there is no discrimination against gender, against race, against culture. We must reach all mankind. Any comments? Now for my last story. Paul was then led to Athens, you know, to the uh, Areopagus, Mars Hill. This Areopagus actually is located near Acropolis. We know that the Acropolis is the ancient location of the government of Athens, the seat of the high court, the seat of the administration. They have the big temple, the Parthenon. This, uh, we can see the ruins today. So Paul was led to the Areopagus. Areopagus actually is the court of the judges and the lawyers. You know, it's like uh, some say that this place is similar to the Roman Senate. So what did Paul do there? Well, Paul was able to preach and witness to these intellectuals, the gospel of Christ, and tell them about his God who made the world and all nations of one blood, whom you inscribe on your altar as the unknown God. See, Paul was able to connect with these intellectuals. So although Paul was not very successful, he did uh, convert Dionysus, the legal counsel or judge, and some man and some woman, and a woman called Damaris. So, so what do we learn from this uh, uh, witnessing of Paul today here? We learn that we all need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, we need his power, and we can see the diversity and the broad spectrum of the society the Holy Spirit reached out and converted. I'm coming to the end of my lesson now. I'd like to end my lesson with a text from uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. I will just paraphrase this text. This text tells you and me, all of us, 
that we are living letters. We are living word. We are living epistles given to us by Christ. We are not letters written in ink or carved in stone, but letters written in human hearts by the Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit makes us all living word, and our strength comes from Jesus and his Holy Spirit. So remember, our yoke is easy and our burden is light. Thank you all for listening.